It is time now to bring Bruce Fraser. So this is today, uh, I want to use stock chart analysis to look at the economy, see if we can draw some conclusions about really the big picture and where we're going to go from here, because this is such an interesting place. As a matter of fact, I'm I'm grateful for the opportunity to sort of talk about this now just because of where the market is. And so let's get started because I have so much to do in so little time. So the uh, Fed policy as of the end of 2018, which concluded on uh, December 17th with a rate hike of Fed funds to 2.5%. We know this is that was the ninth rate hike by the Fed. So we know that rate hikes uh, generally with a lag slow the economy. And so there's evidence of that happening. The other thing we have is we have tariff wars. And these tariff wars uh, have the effect of increasing costs throughout the whole world economy and also have the effect of uh, slowing economic conditions and slowing slowing growth. So the third thing that we have is we have a currency war. And this uh, currency war is resulting in a strong dollar. This is a tax on US exporters. It has the effect of uh, lowering prices of imported goods, but it has the effect of making it harder for exporters to sell their goods uh, outside the country. This has the effect of slowing economic growth domestically. So we're totally in the soup. This is like, (laughs) there's nothing good here. (laughs) And so, uh, but we we do have hope. And so here we can see what is the antidote to the slowing economy? First of all, the uh, tariff wars uh, are still with us. The strong dollar and the currency wars are still with us. The Fed has not turned directions and started to lower uh, their policy interest rate. So uh, interest rates are still up. But we also have a stock market, and I'll show you this in a minute, that is very close to its highs. So what is the antidote to a slowing economy? Well, uh, we can have lower interest rates. Lower interest rates spurs economic growth. Uh, The Fed, and that's largely a market function, and it's also a Fed function. We can increase the money supply, which is a function of the Fed. Lower the value of the currency. That can be done in a multiple number of uh, strategic ways. Uh, stimulate Stimulate inflation which the Fed has now said that they would like to see inflation rise. So they are looking at ways to stimulate inflation as a way to stimulate economic growth. Physical fiscal policy is another thing that can happen, and that's usually done in Congress and with the administration. And an example of that might be infrastructure spend, uh, which we don't have. Uh, The uh, other thing would be to reduce or eliminate tariffs, which has the effect of improving business conditions uh, for everyone. And uh, lastly, we have presidential politics, which comes into play uh, kind of with a dance between the Fed and uh, the administration uh, going into an election year, which is next year. So and we're going to get into these from a technical perspective, a Wyckoffian perspective. I would like to announce that TSAASF, which is a not-for-profit technical society, has a phenomenal free webinar on Monday, which is uh, Dow Theory Trading uh, with Alex Ivanov. And he is or was a mentor of Richard Russell, who was the really the grandfather of uh, Dow Theory. And so it's going to be a very interesting uh, presentation. All you have to do is go to tsaasf.org, sign up. It's free. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I'll see you there. Okay, so let's get started. So we can see here that uh, this is the S&P 500 going back into 2015, really a dramatic uptrend. that was stopped with the buying climax uh, at the beginning of 2018. 
became range bound with an automatic reaction here. So we now have a range bound condition and this range bound condition has been with us for 18 months. And here we are right back on the edge here of the uh, April May highs that and we're flirting with this area. And this is despite all the things that we just talked about. So the stock market has really reacted quite well after having a shakeout in December, had a very good rally into uh, the first half of the year. And this uh, very good rally in the S&P uh, was somewhat stimulated by falling long-term interest rates, which we'll look at in a minute. But here we are right on the knife's edge. This is right on the edge of an important area of resistance, which we can see the buying climax, that resistance line there. We are slightly above it. We've upthrusted it. Upthrusting a resistance line can be a place that can be quite dangerous. So what would be the conditions by which we would see the S&P turn down from this level versus being able to stabilize here and turn up, break out of an 18 month trading range and go into a new uptrend. So we will look at some examples or some charts here that might help us with this. The shakeout was quite a dramatic uh, exhaustion of the decline and this rally has been exceptionally good. Well, I wanna point out something that is a Wyckoffian concept which is notice the pullback here. This pullback, which at the time seemed kind of sharp in uh, April, May, only went back about a third, roughly a third of the advance. And at, at that point in this support area, uh, it found a good low and turned around and rallied right back up to the highs again. And this ability to be able to turn pivot right off of that low and rally right up to the sign of strength area here is, uh, I think, a very bullish thing and suggests that uh, the market, even though it is at this important resistance area, has the potential to get up and out of this uh, accu accumulation or reaccumulation zone. And we'll talk about why in a minute. So just keep this in mind. This is 18 months in duration. It's been a long time. Uh, the market has basically made no progress, but the rally that we've had since December has been uh, quite dynamic. Okay, now here, this is like the uh, three pauses that we've had in this uh, really uh, exceptional bull market. And these three pauses, the first two have been 21 months in duration. And underneath, I put some uh, economic data but you can see here that they went into a uh, uh, pause, went into a pivot, turned up and started a new uptrend. And we can see in the case of the uh, this and the, they're about this one uh, was 2011 to 2012. At the end of 2012, it went into a new uptrend here, 2015, 2016, late in 2016, it went into a new uptrend. And here we are in a very similar situation today. Well, what are the common characteristics that we have in these three pauses? Well, each of them were economic pauses. And in the case of this first one, there was a tremendous amount of fear that the economy was going to go back into another recession back in 2011, 2012. There was still an immense amount of fear. And you can see that the GDP growth was uh, pretty lackluster. It was 1.6 at the beginning of this era in the first year, 2.2 in the second year, and uh, which is you know pretty low. Unemployment rate, eight and a half as it began, 7.9 towards the end, very high unemployment. And then inflation dropped from 3% down to 1.7. So inflation actually in each of these uh, periods, these pauses, the inflation rate has been relatively mild and stable. And one of the things that the Fed will look at to uh, determine their uh, policy regarding interest rates is they'll look for an overheating economy. And one of the ways they measure that is inflation. And so the fact that the Fed raised interest rates nine times since 2015 
uh, really belies the idea that we had an overheated economy because arguably we didn't. Now, uh, here we have uh, GDP 2.9 to 1.6, unemployment's dropping, so 5% to 4.7, and then inflation 0.7 to 2.1. So uh, unemployment is, uh, is dropping from a very high level, which is uh, very good news. And now what we have is we have GDP, as we saw in the first quarter, 3.1 uh, from what Tom told us, and the uh, unemployment rate is at 3.9. Now, and inflation is not rising. So the interesting thing about unemployment at 3.9 is that when you get down towards full employment is when you can start to have uh, true wage growth and where uh, em employees become hard to find, have to pay more to get employees, and uh, existing or employees that are at work in these companies are starting to see real wage gains. And uh, this is something that I think that the Fed wants. They want to see the, uh, the, the workers, they want to see employment starting to make real uh, wage increases going forward. And so this is going to temper their interest in having um, uh, continuing to tighten. Okay, so uh, we're right at the edge, and this is why I call it the knife's edge here, because here we are just pushing up against this important resistance area and having a, a condition where if we have the right catalyst, we could jump out of here. I think that catalyst is tariffs. So uh, let's look at what's happened, though, with interest rates, and we'll circle back to tariffs. So uh, this is a very important thing. You've probably seen this chart before. I've published this in um, blogs. I believe I've talked about it here. But notice what happened back in uh, 2018. For most of 2018, uh, Treasury bonds have gone went in. This is seven to ten year Treasuries have gone into a uh, accumulation phase. So this is classic accumulation right here, and this set up a point and figure count objective. And you can see these counts on here. I'll show you the point and figure chart in a minute. But these were dramatic counts. And uh, I actually only posted the first two counts because I thought, you know, this is just going to be a monster rally in bonds if it can get up to this 107.25 level. But in fact, it blew right through it. And it blew through my stretch count here of 107.91, 108.57. And this goes to the idea that the market, if we just study the technicals, the market will tell us where it wants to go and what it wants to do. And this is why I just look at the charts. I, I look at the uh, uh, price data series, point figure charts, vertical charts, and I let them do the talking. So here uh, is the 10-year... Uh, yield chart and you can see it went from around 3.20 down to 2.02 and since just from october november of last year a dramatic decline in interest rates so even though the fed actually raised rates on december 17th uh, of the fed funds rate long before that the treasury market was cutting rates and it's significant that the that the treasury market was having a dramatic decline in interest rates and a dramatic rally in uh, the bond market. So this is about, I think, a 13% rally. The TLT or the 20-year treasuries rallied over 20%. And I'll show you those in a minute. But uh, this is a uh, very important way that the economy itself, the market itself lowered interest rates ahead of the Federal Reserve. This is why we always want to look at the data series and not wait for official policy, because by the time that happens, uh, the move is uh, typically over. OK, so here's uh, this blog, if you want to go back and look at this December 10th, and at that time, uh, we had a jump out on the seven to 10 year treasuries that went. Uh, so you can see 
right along here, there's a jump out. And this jump out was right at the point where it said, okay, I'm ready to mark up. And this is at this point, uh, I put in these objectives, the top objective I put in later, which is to here. And you can see that this is a uh, dramatic, uh, the beginning of a dramatic move. And uh, I concluded in the blog, there's a substantial cause built for a rally. And that's exactly what we got. Okay, so uh, I just did this chart. I wanted to show you another way to look at this. This is a three box reversal point and figure here. And I did 25 uh, point or quarter point scaling three box reversal, you can see it encompasses all of 2018 across here. And look at the count. The count goes right to within one box of the objective that we've just reached. And my belief is, is that uh, even though, and I think Tom has a good point about th that uh, bond prices could pull back some here, that just bonds being in this level of interest rates is very supportive of the uh, economy because these rates are going to stay down here and they're going to probably either just pause or build a new cause or whatever. But I don't think that they're going to move much uh, in, in the near term. Now, this chart is the TLT, which is 20, the 20 year. And I have a very important reason to show this to you because here you can see back in 2015, 16, which remember, this was the last turn that we had in the stock market. Remember that 2015, 16, the economy sort of stalled out. The stock market stalled out, went sideways for a period of time. Well, look what happened. The 10 year, now this is 10 year yields. I should have put 20, so I apologize for that. But it's it really tells the same, same tale. And that is you can see that the bond market started to drop interest rates and they went from 2.5% down to 1.4 and produced a dramatic rally. Look at that beautiful climax, climactic surge, stop the advance. Well, look where we are. We're right back where we uh, were before, right there. Important resistance, probably a reason why the market will pause here for some period of time. But look at this with the lag. Okay, so we have the interest rates uh, right here at 2.5. You can see that they went down to 1.4. I'm just going to draw a line straight down to the stock market. Well, notice this. The stock market had already started to rally and was in the beginning of a very important advance, which took us right up to the climax at the beginning of 2018. So here we have this uh, now this big trading range, which we just talked about. Well, look what's happened here. Family resemblance R rates have gone from 3.2 down to 2.02. Now that's on the 10 year, uh, a little bit more on the 20 year. But look at this with the lag, a low was put in. The stock market started to advance. The stock market started to advance with a lag at the beginning of 2016. We're seeing the same thing happen here with the S&P and the bond market. So already, uh, we have this uh, really great rally with uh, capacity with all of these headwinds, tariffs, rising uh, short-term interest rates, uh, rising dollar. We have a stock market that's right up against its highs. So this is very encouraging. So this is the 20 year. What's most interesting here about this is notice that we have a fulfilled count of this area of the 2018 accumulation area, well, we also have a higher count. So is it possible, I just put this out as a question, that 20-year Treasury bond prices could even go higher and rates could go lower? This point and figure chart suggests that there's the potential to do that. This is the yield curve. So as this line drops, it means the yield curve is flattening. I wrote a blog on that back in December so you can see yield curve inversion and read about it. This is the 10 year and the two year. So this is what we're comparing in this yield curve, but get this, look at how the curve is starting to turn up or steepen. That just looking at that chart of that data and seeing it rising tells us that 
uh, the yield curve has stopped flattening. It's starting to steepen, and this is accommodative to the stock market, and it's accommodative uh, to the economy. So here you can see it also in this 2015-2016 period, we can see flattening of the curve, and then it started to turn up and steepen, and that helped to produce the easy money environment that helped the stock market to rally up and out of its prior trading range in 2015, 2016. So we're starting to see that if the Fed cuts rates in the near term, say in July, and maybe again later in the year, this is going to steepen further. That line's going to keep going up. So uh, the other thing is that the market has already steepened in that if you compare T-bills, so I just wrote this down last night. Uh, I was talking to my dear friend, Joe Turner, and we were talking about this, and I thank him for his help, is that the Fed funds rates around 2.37, 2.38 right now. Well, the 26-week T-bill is currently at 2.13. It's below the Fed funds rate, which is not a typical relationship. Normally, the Fed funds rate is lower. So even the T-bills, the 26-week T-bills are saying, that there is easing coming. There are, is a uh, rate cut coming from the Fed in the not too distant future. Uh, this is from a blog. At, now, by the way, I'm going to do charts uh, of stocks and industry groups in my vi my power charting video tomorrow, which is going to be what I'm which I'm calling part two of this presentation. So I'm going to show some ideas that I think could benefit uh, in tomorrow's video. So please turn to that. And uh, here, this now, now we're gonna turn to the dollar. And so you can see here that the dollar has been running up into, uh, the, look at this dramatic trading range that goes all the way back to 2015. So notice that in 2015, 2016, the dollar actually weakened, which uh, can help the uh, economy to kick off, but then it got very strong again. Look at this incredible rally in the dollar, unbelievable. But climax, automatic reaction, a range bound condition that goes all the way back to 2015. Well, now look at this rally that we're having. This long laborious advance is a diagonal triangle. So each one of these rallies and reactions has become more muted as it gets further up and my contention is that this whole area is distribution of the dollar and the dollar is going to have a break. That break in the dollar is going to be good for the uh, domestic economy. It's going to increase inflation and it's also going to be good for um, uh, exporting. Now, uh, there's two messages I want to give here and then I'm going to zoom into this ch chart uh, quickly in a, in a few minutes. And that is that uh, gold, which is this bottom chart, tends to run counter or inverse to the dollar. Strong dollar, weak gold. Strong gold, weak dollar. And it's because the gold is a uh, currency surrogate. So you can see here, uh, again, uh, strong dollar, weak gold, et cetera, et cetera. Well, look what happened in uh, 2018, 2019 and uh, go back and look at my August 2018 blog on gold and notice that we've had this terrific rally in gold while we had a rally in the dollar. So a change of character. And this change of character suggests that there's something internal, a strengthening in the gold market that is uh, showing up irrespective of the dollar being strong. So gold is gaining value in the strongest currency. And here you can see there was an attempt to back up. And on this backup, there was a top built in gold in the dollar, which I'll show you a little more closely in a minute. And uh, this top being built in the slightest volatility and decline in the dollar and look at gold just take off. So this whole area here was tipping the hand that something was different in the gold market. And I think that gold is sniffing out that there's a change coming in the relationships of these major currencies. This is a 
distribution on a rising scale in a diagonal triangle. This is the area we just looked at. And I ha have uh, made dr done a blog on this uh, that you can go back and look at and look at this chart with one change. I'm calling this an upthrust after distribution. So it upthrusted this area and then with volatility, it's fallen right out of the channel. And I believe that this whole area here is distribution and that when you have an upthrust after distribution and a failure, these markets can and typically do move relatively quickly down to an important support area. And so I believe this automatic reaction that I've drawn is an important support area. And I think that the dollar could go there and go there pretty quickly. So uh, this could be, and you can see here how uh, gold has just uh, taken off with uh, already with just the slightest decline in the, uh, the UUP, which is my surrogate for uh, the dollar. Okay, I'm going pretty fast here. Uh, the only thing you've seen this chart before, the only thing I want to show you is uh, the month of June. So this is a seven year downtrend in gold. And we've been uh, posting this chart for a long time. Look what happened. It broke above its long term downtrend and uh, went right up to this important resistance area that goes all the way back. It was formed in 2013. And so here we are right at that area, which is around 1410. And uh, we'll see how gold reacts to that, whether it pauses here for how long. My expectation is, is that gold will just pause uh, and not pull back very much. And because I believe that there's a lot of short covering that needs to take place. And there's a lot of shorts that are uh, uh, basically trapped here right now at this resistance area. So this is going to be very interesting to watch and go look at my August uh, 2018 blog on gold. I believe gold, uh, well, gold has really outperformed since August of 2018. And uh, it's been really uh, leading the way. And this resistance area is quite formidable and very important. But here's put, putting my white coffee and hat on is that this entire area looks like a big accumulation. And what happens when you get into the late parts of an accumulation is notice the higher lows. So every time gold would pull back all the way back into 2015, every time it would pull back, it would pull back less into a higher low, which tells me that there's systematic accumulation by very large interests. And so once gold is well accumulated, and in very strong hands, then uh, it can move easily upward because uh, there's uh, uh, very little gold available to be bought. And so there's a shortage of gold in the marketplace to be bought. And so this would be my concern here, especially for the short sellers that have been shorting gold now for years, is that now just the short sellers could be the fuel that could drive gold uh, right out of this accumulation area but we're at the top of it now so there's a number of things that could happen it's run dramatically up to that 1410 area but it could just as easily pull back really hard off of that but it is above this downtrending trend trend line and so i suspect that what it's going to do is it's just going to pause here and it's just going to hang out at this area and then uh, start to rally again. I do think that gold can perform with or better than the S&P just because of that big accumulation area. Yeah, I don't I I would uh, I'm going to disagree with you if that's OK. It's perfectly OK. <laughs> um, I just it kind of uh, scares me, actually. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, I did come in uh, in that discussion. I said that it would outperform. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, two to uh, one. Yep, always. <laughs> oh, I like it. Yeah. Yep. Well, we do need to move on, but you gave okay. everybody a lot to think about. Um, great presentation, Bruce. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, I love being here, and we'll do it again sometime soon. All right. Sounds good.